Welcome to tonight's podcast with Ryan Sean O'Reilly, David Wilkinson, and Richard Mell. This is There is No Deodorant in Outer Space. Now, let's begin. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever the case may be. This is There Is No Deodorant in Outer Space. Welcome back to our podcast, or welcome if you haven't heard us before. With me tonight is David Wilkinson. Hello. Dave, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, uh, okay. I'm in the middle of moving. I had to put, go on. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Moving is always fun. Uh, also joining us again is Richard Mel. Rick, say hello. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's great to be back again. And it's great to have you. Uh, you also notice uh, we are actually absent one, um, our original co-host, James Rauch, a.k.a. Beam, is not joining us tonight uh, for unknown reasons. What's the uh, the Passover tradition where you, you leave like some matzah out for the, the prophet? Is that, a, is that a Elijah or Isaiah or some Jewish guy, you know, like that? Maybe this is the year he comes. Joseph and the technical no, dream coat? No, no, no. I, I, you think he had North, eh, had a North Face joke in there somewhere, but no, no, anyways. Yeah, Beam's a, not here. Did, does anyone know where he is? Or I, I think he's paying repentance or something like that. Who, who knows? I, if we want to take this into a religious direction, I, I, I'd be at a loss. <laughs> All right, well, moving forward. Tonight we will be discussing the book A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, which is the first book in, I guess you would call it, his John Carter series or his Barsoom series, and the movie John Carter, which was directed by Andrew Stanton, starred Taylor Keach and was actually uh, produced by Disney. So... Why don't we just go around real quick and everyone just kind of give a summary of their thoughts on, you know, what they thought overall, just in five sentences or less, just give me a summary of your thoughts of the book and movie. Uh, Wilk, we'll start with you. The overall racist gist of this book I found quite humorous, and it brought me back to days of yore where it was okay to, you know, hate Indians. Okay, yeah. uh, let's, let's try that again. Wilk, let's, let's start with you. I, I, I'm not joking. That's my, I'm, I'm being dead serious. This book is like completely. It's a, written a hundred years ago. It, it, it's so overtly racist. I mean, the main character is a Civil War hero who fought for the Confederacy, <laughs> who was loved by his slaves. You know, I mean, that's like the first page. It's an, oh, it's, the, it's the, so, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the book is a clear, clear, clear metaphor for the savagery of the Indians. He doesn't even pull punches about it. it I mean, and again. The Indians said a lot of crap, uh, uh, but they don't get credit uh, for it. All right, let's, uh, we can get into, let's I'm, I'm, get into that. Five I'm, sentences. Okay. I, 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 this is really where okay. I'm going with this. I'm, so, I'm not you being obnoxious. Yeah. Okay, Rick, what about you? Five sentences or less. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Wilk. I was completely turned off uh, for the first you know, ten chapters of this book. It was nauseating. I wanted to vomit um, just because it was just overtly racist. <laughs> okay, this book is a uh, kind of like the first um, gargantuan. It's a, it's an epic uh, Martian odyssey, and, and it starts off kind of rough, but um, it really uh, grew on me as uh, the plot progressed and as I got to know the characters a little bit more. Um, at first, I hated John Carter, and then uh, it ended up that I, I kind of liked the guy. So that's my take on my okay. quick take on it. Uh, but for me, I'll say that uh, to sum up my thoughts. I feel that John Carter kind of seems like a jerk, but uh, Mars seemed kind of cool. And I guess right. that's okay. kind of where I'm coming from. So the book, of course, was written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, Rick, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about him? Well, Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, he uh, he grew up in Oak Park uh, to a businessman, father, and uh, he went to some of the best schools, uh, Phillips Exeter, uh for high school and uh, he went to Michigan Military Academy and then he tried to get into West Point. He failed the uh, entrance, entrance exam and that probably put a chip on his shoulder for the rest of his life, I'm sure. He 
So after he, did he have some health? Didn't he have some health problems that got him out of the military? At some he point? had full blown AIDS, I believe. He was <laughs> he was, wait, he open, was uh, homosexual, and he contracted AIDS. AIDS. Homosexual AIDS, of course, yes. Uh, I mean, tar- I mean, Tarzan actually was the origin of AIDS. They, 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 that story was never published, but he did reproduce with chimpanzees and primates, which of course <laughs> carried the AIDS virus over. But that's I'm getting ahead of myself. Go on. Yeah. You're screwing with his legacy. There's probably people out there who are going to listen to this and then sue your ass. Oddly, oddly enough, legacy was the name of his favorite chimpanzee who he did screw with, and that's how the whole virus. I, I see in Wikipedia that he had actually had a heart problem. Yeah, that was his excuse for uh, leaving the uh, the Seventh Cavalry in Arizona, um, and that was about like I think that that was like the late 1800s. He was like in his mid to early 20s, uh, so really no. I think it was just a straight up health excuse. It wasn't that he was afraid. I, I think he was very patriotic, uh, almost too much, uh, to the point where he was kind of like a, uh, uh kind of like a zealot. Uh, but, uh, he, uh, he was released or discharged, I should say, because of a heart condition. And then, uh, you know, his, the fact that he was out in Arizona kind of speaks a little bit about his fascination with Mars because it was always envisioned that Mars had, you know, canyons and desert dry land. So, um, what else? He, uh, actually, he, he went out to Arizona. Didn't yeah. He? he was stationed in Arizona in the seventh cavalry. So, um, a- after that, he kind of floated a little bit and, uh, it's kind of hilarious, like how he, uh, was inspired to write. Um, he, they got a quote here from, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Wikipedia. Well, he, he said, if people were paid for writing rot, such as I read in some of those magazines, that I could write stories just as rotten. As a matter of fact, although I had never written a story, I knew absolutely that I could write stories just as entertaining and probably a whole lot more so than any I chanced to read in those magazines. Um, he, he speaks about those magazines like he totally spurns them, but I can totally see him reading those damn things every fucking day and just like... Say I can do better than this. I'm better than these people. I I, I can do this, you know. And uh, that's how he was motivated to write, which is kind of pathetic. But you're yes. talking about this is like I guess the golden age of sci-fi, where it was like the height of the, or it becomes the height of the the pulp era of Megan. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily call the golden age of sci-fi. I mean, you know, Asimov didn't come along until like the 40s, you know. And I I would think that would be the golden age of it. I think this was kind of like the beginning. Yeah, okay, of it. it's a progenitor to the golden age. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he he was married for like a good thirty forty years to uh, his childhood sweetheart, and then uh, as he grew more popular, um, he, they got divorced after having two children. And he married a uh, an actress in Hollywood, and he kind of claimed the quintessential American fame that many people sought after, um, and still do to this day. So. He kind of lived the the life of a rock star in his way back in those days. Uh, he actually got a piece of land called it uh, Tarzana, you know, after his favorite character. Um, well, he and he is of course the author of uh, Tarzana. That, that's of course that's right. Um, so I, kind of like an interesting guy, very entrepreneurial. He was the first to uh, kind of uh, distribute the idea of Tarzan across many different forms of media. It wasn't just his. Uh, serial stories of, of Tarzan that he uh, he wanted to distribute. He he put Tarzan on like cereal boxes and well I, I don't know about that but comics. He pursued he pursued many types of media yeah. for for his character and for stories. It, when the twenties came out, there was a very popular form of birth control featuring Tarzan too. It was a uh, diaphragm with Jane's face on it. <laughs> so um, anything else, Rick? About him that that you find uh, you found interesting. Well, I, I guess uh, when I read when I read the you know the first few chapters of John Carter, I'm like, you know, th- this guy is so despicable because he's such a damn racist. Well, um, I, I thought he had Osbergers almost. I mean, he was like, yeah, he exactly. It's he, like, it's like he, he, I will do this with honor because I am a man with honor, and that is why I do it. Like, oh my god, yeah. It's like the there was so much exhibition in, in how he spoke. But yeah, go on. I, 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 I was I was thinking the whole time that I'm I'm just reading about the the author's alter ego and how I just totally despise the author, you know, and like uh, he was just writing about himself the whole time, or about like how he, 
who he fantasized uh, to be, you know, while he was just sort of floundering around trying to, uh, you know, progress his, his profession in writing. Uh, he was always fantasizing about being on a planet where he was the most powerful being and a bunch of stupid idiots <laughs> worshipped him. And he, at the same time, he would like berate them and their whole race and civilization. You know, I mean, he would fantasize about this stuff. And it kind of turned me off for the first 15 chapters or so. You know, but then the story really progressed, I thought. It, he did He did actually uh, put himself in the story. There's an actual frame story in this book where Edgar Rice Burroughs is the, is the nephew of the main character, which is interesting. The, the other thing that I noticed, which um, doesn't relate to that, but when he first published this, he was still wanted to be um, a, a businessman, and actually not a writer. And so he was worried that his business clients wouldn't take him seriously. So he published this under the name, it was supposed to be Normal Bean, so people would realize that he wasn't crazy, but then some typesetter misspelled it and made it Norman Bean um, when it came out. And he—that's kind of an indication of insanity to me, you know. If you uh, if you want to like just make sure that everyone, <laughs> if you if your pseudonym is normal, it just it, that just doesn't really click. I, I don't know. There's something crazy and about this. That. Also, I think originally came out in magazines. He I think he wrote. Uh, about half the length of what it, it ended up being, and he submitted it to an All Story magazine, and then um, they asked him to expand it to a full length novel, and then they serialized it, which I think a lot of stories back then were serialized in the magazines, and then it was later released altogether as a novel. And some yeah, well the yeah the, the publishing date's nineteen seventeen, I think, right? Yeah. And then it references that it was first published in nineteen twelve. So this, that's probably in the magazine, right? Right. So you got that. I, I didn't really hate the character ever, though. I, I, I just started reading this. I just started cracking up, thinking, okay, well, this is a this is a different time. This book's being written in. And I kind of I kind of just went with it and liked the story. Yeah, it's a, it's a completely different time. But I, do you guys have anything else to say about Burroughs, or do you want to get into the book? Let's get into the story. I, I, I'm done with Burroughs. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Then uh, to set up the book, Rick, why don't you just give a quick you know synopsis of the story? A synopsis. And then let's get into okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I just finished the book like 20 minutes ago. Um <laughs> It, it should be it should be fresh in your mind. Yeah. Well, it starts off uh, him getting out of uh, well, it's his memoir, so it's being read by his uh, his nephew. As his nephew starts reading it, it just goes right into the story. The forward explains the the backdrop of his nephew finding his. When you say he, you, you mean John Carter. John Carter. John Carter's yep. nephew picks up his uh, his diary about you know his times on the planet Mars, uh, which. You know, do they really exist, or or was it just a dream? Who knows? But um, how did he get to Mars? It's kind of that's the soft science fiction part of this book. No one really knows. It's just kind of magic, I guess. But uh, he starts out just out of the Civil War and prospecting for gold with uh, one of his comrades in the uh, Confederate Army, and they're in Arizona, and they come across a uh, a vein of of gold in. Uh, a quartz meet him, I suppose. They they're planning how they're going to extract the vein, and his his buddy Captain Powell he goes off to find some mining machinery to bring back to the site, and uh, he's he's jumped by a band of uh, Apache Indians who are just you know despicable in every way, and uh, he finds he finds Captain Powell dead in, a, in an encampment. Which he storms like an idiot with his guns blazing and on his horse. It, it kind of sets uh, up his personality for the rest of the book. Right, exactly. It just kind of sets the whole precedent and how kind of audacious this guy is. And I mean, I guess it works because uh, he he goes in with such confidence, it just scares the hell out of everybody because they think he's just kind of like the the lead rider of a, a battalion of cavalry. But you know, it's just him. And again, hey, real quick though, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna. Go on a tangent here throughout this thing, but I thought there's a lot of references in this book that were incorporated by things that are more contemporary. Like that thing right there, it reminded me of that classic scene in Star Wars where Han Solo does the same thing in the Death Star. He goes running you know, <laughs> madly after the stormtroopers, they all run away. And, I, and I, as I kept reading this, my dad's generation, they loved this guy. When they were like 10, 12, 15 years old, they were reading these books left and right, these serial novels. And I think yeah. it really shows in some of the things like Philip K. Dick we discussed before. He's incorporated a lot of the things in here directly in some of his stories. But like, there's a lot of things throughout this book that I didn't that have that I thought were original ideas from the 70s and 80s that clearly aren't. 
And right, I don't know, and that little scene right there, I thought was kind of reminiscent of a very classic scene yeah. in, uh, in Star Wars. Right. Okay, so uh, he picks up the body of uh, Captain Powell, brings it to a cave where he falls under some sort of mystical sort of slumber and he's petrified. He thinks he's awake, but he can't move. And he all of a sudden he finds himself on Mars. All right. And he comes upon a, uh, a Martian, green Martian incubator where a bunch of eggs are hatching. And he comes into contact with his first alien intelligence form, which is the green Martian. And they're, they're kind of savages. I guess if you're into Game of Thrones, they're like the uh, Dothrakis. They have a very fine sense of honor and justice through... Uh, their might and might does make right. And after all, it is the planet Mars, uh, which is sort of like the embodiment of masculinity. He, he knows this as he figures out that he's on Mars and he knows what he needs to do to survive. And that is to be as savage and as cunning as he possibly can. And he, f- he figures out like this, um, this green Martian race is, uh, kind of like, they live by this law where might does make right, and you are a leader if you can kick somebody else's ass and sort of protect your, uh, you know, um, your tribe. And the way that you, well, I, I we'll go into this, but well, let, well, anyway, Rick, let me yes. stop you. The synopsis is, it, is getting way too detailed. I know. Will, Will, I think you could do a real quick synopsis. Go ahead, Will. Basically, he, when he pops up on Mars magically. He runs into a tribe of savages. They're fighting with other savages. They're very savage. There's a more sophisticated culture who happen to look just like humans. They're red, not green. He falls in love with one of the women there. There's a big war. There's a big battle. There's a big journey. There's lots of creatures. And then there's an end. And the end is kind of a <laughs> okay. cliffhanger because it's a serial. So that, that was a lot more brief. But right. uh, okay, okay, so th- that's the synopsis. We'll just kind of go with that. <laughs> uh, Wilk, you were bringing an interesting point. Let's go back to that, which is the influence this book had on... Others, which, which is, you know, probably we're more aware of, like, namely, like, like George Lucas and Star Wars was, uh, I think a lot of stuff was probably drawn from this series for Star Wars. Like, you just. Yeah, George Lucas and Spielberg loved serial novels of, and they called them the 40s and 50s that became, you know, drive in movies in the 50s and 60s. But, I mean, this is a class. I read a lot of these serial novels as a kid because my dad had them, and he's that, that same generation. But, like, these authors that were, like, of this era, they were, they were survivors or they, they had relatives that fought in the Civil War that dealt with Indians and, the influence is there, and like to me, what I thought was really interesting is like you can't get away with this shit today. <laughs> That's in no, this book. I mean, it, it, but it didn't bother me. I thought it was kind of you know humorous, entertaining, but like it was a very, very clear metaphor that the uh, uh, the Green Men were the Indians and they were savages, and he was trying to draw a parallel between the you know the American West and all that kind of stuff. But but the bottom line is, I thought it was a great story. I thought there was great ideas and great mm-hmm. imitation. There was suspense. I really got into it, and I thought it was. <laughs> His, the worst part was the way that he wrote for his character, but in almost every great, uh, any great work of fiction, at least that's you know translates like a film medium, the least interesting character is the main one, almost every time in, in action and comedy. And John Carter is no exception. I mean, he's just there to kind of carry the story through, and you're observing things through his eyes. And I liked what I was seeing. Well, you know, but I'll say that's where I think this book suffers. Is because if you're gonna write the book in first person, which this book is, it, <laughs> I mean, the guy, yeah. To me, he kind of comes off really pompous and overconfident, and he just he can do no wrong, and everything he does is great. And he feels as if he's entitled to uh, to everything, and at the same time, he's respected for that. And... I, I think it gets it gets in the way of the story. I I, I felt myself trying yeah. to dis- uh, slightly distracted by the constant bravado in uh, self, right. you know, patting himself on the back constantly. I as well. He remind me he remind me of people that we all know that like it's like everything they have is. If you have one, they have a bigger one. If you have a fast one, theirs is faster, and they paid less for it. And yeah, I just he mind. Yeah, yeah, he's that kind of guy. And I'm friends with these kinds of people. I just don't take it that seriously. I'm like, right, yeah, okay, you know. It's but like what was going on around him. I thought. I mean, and again, to me, the really impressive part is that at no point did he rape anyone in the story. Because I'm just waiting for him to like seriously. And I'm not trying to be, you know, cutting edge here. But like, he had plenty of opportunity. Yeah. I, I just kept waiting for this scene where he's like t- takes his rights upon a woman. Oh, I saved your life, and I am going to take. No, and that never happened, so kudos right. to him for not being rapey. Although all the natives of the planet are running around naked, pretty, pretty much, except for jewelry. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. yeah, but that's not, that, 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 nudity, I don't know, it's not really rapey. So did you, now, yeah. it's also, the writing style is, you know, sort of dated, uh, and there's occasional archaic, archaic words in there and archaic spelling. That didn't really bother me overall. 
I did feel like the style of the writing is a lot of telling versus showing. Burroughs speed through, speeds through, you know, wars and and action, and in unlike modern writers, he doesn't show a lot. That's fine though. I think action's hard to write. I think I think he does set the scene though. He 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 does describe the Martian terrain fairly well. Uh, he describes settings, uh, maybe not maybe not the cities so well, but like the landscapes and. You know. he, yeah, he has a description up, but I'm talking about um, when the action happens. A lot of times you're just being told what happens and you're not really in the action. Like a modern writer yeah. like Stephen King would make you feel the, ba- you know, the yeah. fighting. And stuff. I think I think some of uh, uh, Edgar's finest descriptions with the fighting was when uh, the two uh, green Martians were attacking each other with, with their hands. They didn't have any weapons. And uh, that was kind of like his best as far as... Uh, Describing the uh, the fighting action, yeah, and it wasn't a scene where John Carter was actively doing something. No, John Carter was an observer there, and he was, yeah, exactly. I think another common trope in this story is that uh, Burroughs tries to make the Martian, the Green Martians, like well, at least Tars Tarkas, who is like I guess the good Martian or one of the good Martians, sort of like a noble savage, which is something he does in Tarzan. He's the he's the house Indian. He has a cabin. His name's Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, he kind of does this with, with, with Tarzan, where it's like, uh, this Tars Tarkas is a savage, but he has good, he's a good heart, and he's able to overcome his sa- savagery. And I think a lot of modern readers don't like that. He, yeah. Years later, there's probably, like, rice or creamed wheat with his picture on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's the good Martian that we all love. Yeah, that's sort of the... He's the house Martian. Yeah, the house Martian. Uh, unfortunate, you know, uh, racism and kind of... In the writing. Eh, yeah. I mean, they did a lot of... It really gets kind of whitewashed in history, but, like, they they, they, uh, they kill a lot of people. Well, Indians kill a lot of people? Yeah, they didn't really... never invented the wheel. I mean, again... Well, I think a lot of people would take issue with what you're saying here. And, yeah. But I, I will say, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, he did have experience with with Indians. Well, yeah, I'm just saying, like, we're, we're very soft now. We, we kill a lot of Indians, too. I mean, obviously, and we, but I mean, we took it, everything they ever had. Yeah, we gave them some stuff back. I mean, the thing is, yeah, 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 we gave them uh, crappy land and took their took the prime land, right? Which was now they have casinos, so yeah. it's it's it's. But that's not the end all be all. They lost their soul in the process. They lost their culture. It was pretty much genocide, Wilk. Yeah, you're basically saying racist stuff, right? And genocide happens, but at the same time, some people you genocide, they don't fight back. Others do. The Indians. Did a lot of their own, you know. These comments are awful. <laughs> Why are they awful? No, they, it's extremely racist. Indians are ter- it's extremely racist. It's not racist. How is it? Ra- that is soft. This is not racist. The Indians did terrible, terrible things to people on a regular basis, <sighs> and terrible things were done to the Indians. That's right. right. So, did two wrongs make a right? Well, you know, I, I don't know who did it. Who did it first? You know, maybe that's that's where we have to. No, well, we don't you know, have to and, and, and look at how. But in the Burroughs, it's a cycle when of he violence, thrusts though. John Carter into Mars, he really is sort of emulating the white man coming into, uh, you know, uh, the, Amer- the, the American land, Indian yeah. territory because yeah. he, he comes in right. guns a blazing and just starting to tell people how it is. I mean, he, liter- he literally right. engages with the aliens who are sort of impressed with him at first, but he just starts kicking butt and you know trying to get himself in charge. And he's even though they're actually kind of nice to him. He, as soon as he meets a, a, a someone who looks like him, he immediately identifies with them and is like, and turns his back on the aliens to help them. And to be fair, the people that look like him, uh, he doesn't turn his back on them. Yeah, well, that too. But like the people that look like him are also a lot smarter, a lot more sophisticated. They have science and culture. They there's a whole chapter to just mocking the green men and their, their yeah, shallow right. ways yeah. and their sense of community. And I mean. Again, but it's, it's contradictory. Program. It's it's all kind of propaganda. It's program language. I mean, th- th- this is what he was taught to think about the Indians since he Burroughs. was born. Uh, so Correct. Yeah. he's brainwashed himself when he talks about the Martians. But then again, he gives everyone good nuggets about how the Martians are the most just people. Uh, you know, they they have a pretty respectable system going, even though he doesn't agree with it. Um, I mean. It, he does talk about some of the positives coming out he of does. the culture. I, I, I'm just thinking, like, right now when we grew up, we were taught to look at the Native Americans or Indians in a different perspective sure. than when he brought up. When he, I mean, he was, and, that, and, that, and that's the difference. I mean, clearly, I mean, there. If you look at the aggregate of history, horrible things happen 
to the Native Americans when settlers got here. Horrible things. Can't can't argue that. But over the course of history, especially along the southern border, like Arizona, Texas, uh, there was repercussions that were felt by a lot of innocent yeah. white people, yeah. settlers. Women and children were just slaughtered by the Apaches. And, and that's reflected in literature. And so this guy is coming from that angle. Where it, very similar And the, he was there. He was there, right? He, right. Didn't he personally have dealings with the Apaches? He did. I'm sure he did. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, look at the um, Middle East or the Israeli-Palestine conflict. And again, I'm not going to say I'm obnoxious here, but you, you can't tell anyone on either side of that fence there right now that they're right or that they're right and their side's wrong because they've all had people killed on both sides. It doesn't really matter who started it. So it's just kind of interesting at the point this book is written in history. This is the perspective and view of Native Americans that they were truly savages, and, and it was written without apology. Like, but I'm right now, I'm kind of apologizing for my comments, but you really can't dispute the Indians did do terrible things to people, but we did terrible things to them as well too. It's just now that it's all over and they they're shit out of luck, we feel bad for the Indians, and that's where we're we are right now. But not mm-hmm. you know, another thing is um, I saw online people said that there's some Western tropes in this story where you have kind of a classic Western theme of, uh, you know, the girl or someone being captive and then needing to be rescued, and then, like, a final showdown with an antagonist at the end. And I, I don't know. I, I mean, it, Why is that a... Or, or, okay, but to be fair, I feel like Westerns took those things from just classic literature anyways. It's not like... Those aren't unique to Westerns. From where? Where, where would Westerns take that from? From this? <laughs> I mean, from anywhere. From... Uh... From samurai tales. I mean, if you look at the classic westerns, they're ba- a lot of them are based on Japanese folklore. They, I mean, the idea of there being a, a lone survivor. Some of them. Some of them, but yeah, I mean, what the the whole idea of a western, the good versus evil, the lone hero, the showdown. It's not a uniquely western thing. It's just a story told through a particular context in history. I, mean, I, I can see. Oh, yeah, I think it's just it's a, it's not maybe it's not unique to western, but it's a common trope of western. Plots and stories. No, but I mean, I get this is kind of a western in the sense from where the author was coming from, it, the cowboy Indian theme. It does fit into a western in that sense, where they're, he's exploring new territory, it's unsettled land. That to me is a western, you know, right. where it's it's new territory. Yeah, well, it's also uh, it's so I guess you'd call it a travelogue plot, where the plot is actually kind of like we have to get from point A to, to point B, and it's kind of like how to you know how we get there, which is uh, the Lord of the Rings has the similar kind of plot structure. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's like the typical Western though, because uh, um, he becomes one of the one of the native Martians. You know, he he finds his his place among them, uh, where where he he becomes almost uh, content with his place, even for a brief time. He still found it. He found his place among them. Uh, so in that sense, it was more of like a, a dancing with the wolves type of Western rather than the conventional Western that you would kind of, uh, see as a rerun from the fifties, you know, uh, it, it was kind of transcendental. Uh, and that's when I started to, uh, sort of respect the, uh, uh, the, the progress of the story. And I was, I was actually kind of happy that it happened and happy that I didn't give up on, uh, just continuing to read the same sort of critical, uh, crap that he was uh, just kind of vomiting out of his uh, onto the onto the story. Well, we t- we talked about a lot about the context of the story, um, and he does get to the well, not a, a lot of deep science science going on, even though it's sort of a it's a science fiction tale. It's more of a I guess a heroic story, but um, I know that he he got some things wrong with actually what Mars was, and even he got probably some things wrong with what you know, people knew about Mars at the time. People didn't know a whole lot about Mars back then, though. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean... But you, you think you were telling me that the, how many moons does Mars have? Zero, man. And he talked about yeah, they're yeah. having, you know, two moons, you know. Yeah, they, they would have known that. Right. I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't. Well, at that time, there there was a, a, a scientist, Percival Lowell, who mistranslated an Italian astronomer who identified these channels on Mars and the mistranslation was that they call them canals. And that's why they think Burroughs put canals in the story. It's based on this mistranslation of this Italian astronomer who saw, saw channels on Mars. So if they were seeing channels and again, different world, I mean, they couldn't communicate as quickly as we could. There was no satellites to verify things. So maybe some people thought there was moons. Yeah. They were like operating, you know, telescopes with glass lenses. I mean, uh, it's not very, Good technology. I like the science. If the science, I'll call it science slash magic that he does and use in his world. 
Uh, he has this kind of system about the ra- uh, taking rays of light and the colors of the rays and using them to power things. And they've got, you know, let's talk about the world building. I, I thought th- this story is not really strong in world building. However, the world building that he does do is kind of fun and interesting. He's got the, the I loved it, he's yeah. got the, the, the different civilizations broken out into city states. The, there's different types of species. He's got, uh, even the green Martians. There, there's different, like, tribes of them who are hostile to each other. Same thing with the, the red Martians. And there's a kind of a backstory of Mars being once kind of a vibrant planet, and now it's sort of a dying planet that turned more barbarian. And it, there's also a shortage of water, and they, they have to develop ways to to grow things on there. And, and these are all, I think, stuff that develops into classic, like, Mars tropes in the future. Whenever we look at Mars, it, it, it kind of, these things kind of come up as, yeah. it, it, in, a, well, in a fiction. or well, Mar- Mars is also, a uh, like, a dying planet. So it, it does get into, like, the uh, post-apocalyptic or, or sort of apocalyptic uh, angle that, that stories take later on, you know, in the century. Yeah, he really sets that up. And I, I really like this fact that there was these ruined cities set about and the Tharks, the Green Martians, were sort of a nomadic people or nomadic group that would travel from ruined city to ruined city and just kind of set up temporary camp in these ruins, but yet the ruins were not completely necessarily empty because they had those uh, strange, like, great white apes that were kind of vicious and they had to watch out that if they went into the wrong building, which Carter experiences, that he runs into this, like, vicious wild animal that's living there that, you know, just wants to kill him. And that, that kind of made the world more real and stuff. And along with the, the you know, the, a lot of the plot is centered around the fact that, I don't think we talked about this, that John Carter is from Earth and Mars is a lower gravity. So thus, uh, John Carter has uh, great, uh, he's got a great strength on this planet. And he can basically kick anyone's butt. And he is... Okay, and again, similar to Superman. This predated the comic Superman, and, and Superman was the same premise too. So that's... Yeah. I can keep... Plus... Okay, I, I loved in this book they had an atmosphere factory. Yeah, just like Philip Kiddick came up with Total Recall, which I thought to, my, to this day Total Recall is one of my favorite books and mm. movies. It, I thought it was just mind blowing science fiction, and I realized I thought it was a very original idea. I saw it when I was ten or eleven, and I'm like, oh, apparently this this asshole came up with it in 1917. So <laughs> I guess I'm an asshole too. I, I had no idea until I read the book. And I, I, again, like Rick, I finished the book today. You know, and it, so it was cool because he kind of throws that in. This kind of like weird scene where he goes to this atmosphere plant, but then he ties it back in at the end when um, it ends yeah. up becoming a, a problem, and it becomes a device and why uh, on uh, or the device that makes John Carter leave, which is uh, he has to sacrifice himself to save the planet and fix this atmosphere plant. Uh, but it was it just kind of helped add to the realism of the world, and that was fun. He's like a very. He's like a very earnest modern Mormon. Uh, he doesn't seem unhappy with who he is, and he's very pious. And, and, and like, I don't think he ever said anything funny the whole book. And he and he kept, he kept killing people like pretty callously. Like, oh, I felt bad I had to kill him, but I did. And I was always I was kind of surprised at how quickly he dealt death. Yeah, based on the character he was. Yeah, he was a murderous gentleman, uh, according to him. Murderous yeah. gentleman, okay. yes. <laughs> But I mean, at the same time, he, he wasn't. A, he, I mean, I guess he wasn't as big as an asshole as he was. I don't know if that was intentional or not. But I, I, I just the first five pages were like the slaves loved him. He's a Confederate soldier, and yeah. I'm like, you know, he didn't. He, he wasn't that. I mean, I don't know if it was like a life lesson they learned there, but he actually, yeah, he, he did some self sacrifice, and I, I don't know. I, I really liked the book. I just, it just, it, it, it I like. It, it was good. I enjoyed it. What'd you think of the? Um... The Martian Society. That was kind of interesting. How? Which one? Well, the the, All the Tharks. I mean, the, I guess in general, the Green Martians, like Rick mentioned, they have their own social mores where they, from John Carr's perspective, they, you know, celebrate uh, physical prowess and and might. Klingons. They were they were like Klingons. I feel like Klingons, oh. Klingons were ripped off from them. really. It was a very similar yeah. culture where or Dothrakis, yeah, Game of Thrones, or okay, um, Dothrakis, um, and if you. If you if you read the comics or watched the Chronicles of Riddick, that movement there is very similar to this culture. Where you get to keep what you kill, kind of thing. And again, this very warlike, absolute honor culture. Which the only time you really see it in society, well, the Apaches are very similar. A lot of the Mexican Native Americans. I mean, I know that sounds weird, but like the Native American tribes that were from Mexico in, in the Southwest had a lot of these customs in place that are now adapted into science fiction in the form of the. You know the the Green Men on Mars and Klingons in Star Trek, where it's like violence and the ability to do violence well is a virtue if done with honor. Mm-hmm. And, um, Predator would be fit into that thing as well too. If you mm-hmm. want a, a more accessible 
type. But again, I, I just keep going back. This is this guy. I felt like a lot of the things that he's setting up in here are still used in a very yeah. contemporary way and in a very in, in almost. No credits given to him, and it, I don't know. I just felt like there, it was kind of cool to see that there's a an origin to some of these things that I've loved my whole life, and I had no idea that people were writing about it back oh, then. Well, you know, I think uh, people have acknowledged their influence, and like George Lucas and uh, Ray Bradbury, James Cameron, uh, among other people, have acknowledged the influence. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it does seem like this this story kind of came out of nowhere when the movie came out. What, what do you guys think about the characters overall? Um, I've seen some stuff online, people kind of cr- criticizing it being a little melodramatic as the characters not having a lot of depth. They're either good or bad. I, I, I would say that um, Tars Tarkas is a lot more, has a lot more depth al- along with uh, Solus, who ends up being his daughter. They do show more depth in, in the kind of dynamic they've got going between them and how they are sort of at odds with their culture. Uh, John Carter, I don't know if he has a lot of depth. And, and Deja Thoris, his you know love interest, she's kind of shallow, I would say, overall. And I and the <laughs> but I can't marry you. I gave my heart to another, <laughs> and you can't even kill him. And the villains are, I don't know. The villains don't really have a lot of. I but I enjoy the simplicity in which the villains got taken care of though, too. It's like. Uh, when Tars Tarka has that big confrontation with the man he's been wanting to kill for the last 40 years, <laughs> it's, he killed him. <laughs> We're going to move on, you know. It's like Yeah, there was no scene on that. Yeah, yet. it's like one line. But, like, to me, it's just, it's like, it, it, it is kind of that relief of a quick magazine read where you can tell, like, I mean, I have to look at the whole series and all, but I, I like the Tars Tarka storyline. I like the whole idea. Like, twi- two, at two points in the novel, there's two people that can't be killed unless they're killed by the right person. Like, uh, John, John doesn't kill... Oh, yeah. Chieftain, because he wants Tars Tarker to kill him. He wants to save that kill for him, which I thought, eh, it's kind of, I mean, he's not, he's not an ass, he, well, he might be an asshole, but he's not a man without honor, I guess, if that makes sense. But he'll tell you that he's a man without honor. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a southern gentleman, he's a, he's a murderous <laughs> gentleman with honor, and my slaves love me. <laughs> The other person he couldn't kill was the uh, the guy that uh, was going to marry. Yeah, uh, Deja was about to marry. His name was like Sab Sab yeah. Than. Well, speaking of which, yeah. maybe we should segue into the movie yeah, here because we're running a little bit long. All right. Well, I would just want to say one last thing about the book. Well, uh, mm. <laughs> what's up with the egg at the, the end? Egg. Oh yeah, yeah. Him and Deja were like uh, scoping that egg out for five years, and it never hatched in front of them. You know, I, I kind of no, it didn't hatch, and I I, I think that it's it's setting right. up the the later books. But I looked online, and actually, it turns out like all the species on Mars uh, lay eggs, including the red Martians, who are basically humans. And apparently, even though John Carter has relations with her, she she lays eggs. Yeah, gives birth to yeah. it. She lays an egg. She lays an <laughs> oh, egg. My. Yeah, that that <laughs> was not disclosed to me. Was... I did not know that the red Martians actually did that. Yeah. That's what I found out uh, on online. Are we gonna have a, are we gonna have a boy, a girl, or an omelet? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just thought it was kind of an. It was. It was a. It kind of fits in with the other stuff he did about making things a little different. So I liked it. All right, let's talk about the movie. Uh, John Carter put out by Disney, directed by Andrew Stanton. Uh, Will, why don't you tell us about Andrew Stanton? Try to stay factual. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Andrew Stanton, legitimately, I think, has got to be some kind of genius because he's he's written some of the most uh, fantastic animated movies and directed them. And I don't know how you direct an animated movie, but I think the writing that he's done. Um, speaks for itself. He wrote Wally, which to date is one of my favorite animated features ever, and I would encourage anybody to watch it, preferably while high, with a good surround system, by yourself, when your kids aren't bothering you. But it's a great, great movie. <laughs> Seriously. And then he wrote, he wrote the Toy Story movies. And if you don't like Toy Stories, I mean, you probably have ball cancer. They're, they're great movies. I mean, they're very enjoyable for anyone. They're well-written. And so, I mean, he has a certain panache and talent. I, I, I can't sit down there like Edward E. Burroughs and say, Toy Story, I could write that. I probably couldn't. I don't have that kind of gentle soul and humor to make something that appealing to everybody. And I think he really has a gift. And this was his first movie that didn't involve cartoons to direct. And yeah. I watched the movie today, and I, and, I, and, I, and I did think to myself, I could have made this a better movie. <laughs> I mean, the, the direction did not seem good. It seemed very choppy and like... I'm, I'm watching it. I'm like, I just read the book and I, and I put the movie in or I download the movie on my iPad. And I'm watching it and my headphones on, not high, unfortunately, but still watching it. And like, it just, I'm like, wow. I mean, like, if I hadn't read the book, I really wouldn't like any of this. And which is true because I had stopped watching it like a year ago when I was on, on the band. 
But yeah, I mean, the movie wasn't terrible, but like, if you're not familiar with the source material, it, it, it's really uninteresting. And if you are familiar with it, it it's very, it, it's kind of, it, it can be done better. It's not, I wouldn't say, it's not even ham fisted, it just, he makes bad choices. Like, it's not compelling to watch. Yeah, you know, and it received mixed critical reviews. I think it did better overseas, I think in Russia, uh, in one, at least in one of the places. But uh, overall, it was considered uh, a, a flop, and they got behind it big time and sort of put it up as their tent pole. I guess because they felt that Stanton could do no wrong after his success with all these animation movies, but this was his first live-action movie. And I, I saw a quote where he... He was telling he he did a lot of reshoot reshooting and but his excuse was that he got the other stuff done quicker and he, he told them up front he was going to be doing a lot of reshooting because this was his first time but he also made a quote saying is it just me or are are we can we can we just do this a lot better than the the people who are used to making live action movies and I guess we found out that that's not true even though that's what he thought another quote I saw him do a TED talk where he was um talking about his various successes and it was kind of interesting because he said when he was were, were you there at the ted conference no i i watched it online he said that i hate ted i, I fucking hate ted and and upworthy ted and upworthy videos are <laughs> fucking worst go on he said that um he was talking about making like uh, toy story and the early pixar stuff and he went into how when they were first doing those stories the studio got nervous and they brought in like a consultant who told them hey you need to have more like sing-alongs and you need to have more songs and you need to have more of like a love interest and do this and that and he basically told them no we're not doing any of that and stuck to his guns which he did with toy story if you remember toy story doesn't have like a sing-along song like you know like little mermaid and all that stuff and he was wildly successful for following his instincts and doing that but i guess when he did this movie he got out of his realm and uh, a lot of people say one of the one of the complaints I saw online from a reviewer was that first of all it doesn't start with the main character it starts almost with like a prologue with these other like secret society element that he brings in. Yeah, let's 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 back up a little bit though. You, you made a good point though um, about he follows instinct of Toy Story. He wrote Toy Story. That was his whole thing. He had a, a singularity of vision, writer and director. Here, he had he, the source material was not his, and I, and I think you can give somebody a little latitude when it's their baby, for, for for lack of a better word. Toy Story was a very well written piece. I think it holds up. I, I mean, I was a kid when that came out, or a teenager, or whatever, but I still enjoy it watching my kids today, and they'll probably watch it with their fucking kids at some point if society doesn't collapse in the next twenty goddamn years. Here, here. But I mean, no, but he, no, yeah. I, I mean, will say that I, from what I understand, Stanton was a huge fan of these books, and he really lobbied for Disney to get back the rights because they had the rights at one time and it never got made, and he really, oh, he fucked them up. He fucked them up. He really pushed this, pushed for this, but yeah. It, it, well, my perspective of the of the movie is, uh, which is kind of, I saw the movie late last night. Uh, I was tired as all hell, um, but uh, it, th- there was so much packed into this movie. It, it's almost as if he tried to take the entire Barsoom series and just cram it into two and two hours and twenty minutes. And yeah, thank you. There was enough in the book. He like was bringing in shit that was nowhere in the, right. in the book. Yeah, and it was confusing to me. Yeah, the Therns. Basically, the the movie starts with this like secret society that's kind of like uh, Jews. Uh, they're Jews, space Jews. <laughs> no, there's a. It's, they're actually. I looked up online. There's a secret society of. They're actually white Martians. They're monks. They're monks. But like, there's a lot of reviews online who's, who are saying he was being anti-Semitic, and they're supposed to be uh, allegorious to Jews. The, the monks that we see in the movie, which I thought was kind of funny. Because I'm like, ah, oh, good. You hate Indians, you hate Jews. It came out later that, uh, I, or I, when I looked online, I saw that these actually characters, I think they are in, in some of the other Mars books, because this is the first book in the series. They're the second one. They were intending to make a trilogy with these movies. And now that, of course, has been shelved. So I guess he was trying to set up the later movies, but uh, maybe he just he just took on too much... Yeah. Too much too too soon. Well, if you're going to make a, a great movie about a great character like John Carter, you got to do. I mean, just be simple. Look at Indiana Jones movies or Star Wars movies. How do they start yeah. out? I mean, like introduce Indiana Jones running through the temple. Create a great scene with the main character so you can hang on to that for the rest of the movie, and it, it'll be yeah, compelling. If they start but, out, yeah, you know what? Like, okay, the opening scene, Carter. Let me just say this: the opening scene with Carter and someone pointed this online. It, they got the ca- the U.S. Cavalry is tracked down John Carter because he was a Confederate cavalry guy, and they want his help on the Indian Territory. And Carter, for un, he doesn't explain. He basically says, "I'm not going to join you guys," and all they want to do is talk to him, them. And he ends up trying to like fight them and kick everyone's butt. And all they're doing is showing up and saying, "Hey, w- we want your help." And it's sort of like comes out of nowhere. His like 
attitude. I, and they also, I just assumed and, he was mad because he took his slaves away. That's all. I mean, makes sense. Well, and they and they also they also throw in a backstory of 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 some family that he had that that died, and does, they, I don't think did they ever explain why his family died. No, no I don't know. And that's not. In the, I mean, in, in the book, not, I think he's a bachelor. Right? He doesn't have a family yeah. in the book. At least in the book I read. So why why time. add that? I mean, I guess to give him death, but. I don't There's about a million ways you could have started off with a good action sequence where he's kind of a hero and he's, you know, he's having to be like the guy that deserted the Confederate Army because he was pro, he, he was he was against slavery right there. He like, and so he's like this rogue guy. I don't know, he, you know. I mean, he is the Nazi. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> like he's the bad guy. Yeah. He's the one that like you know started a civil war because he wanted to have slaves, and you got to overcome that obstacle right away. And yeah, him like, you know, spitting in the face of the uh, U.S. cavalry doesn't really. So the, uh, yeah, it, it was bad direction. The movie was good at parts. He, he romanticized the South, though. He romanticized the South and all of the 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 the, <clears throat> the whole lifestyle of the but, South. Well, Burroughs right? does, but I, but in the movie, they strip away a lot of, uh, well, of Carter's course, yeah. uh, bravado and an attitude. He's not he's not the same you, character. Do you think that's the work of the FCC, or do you think uh, there there are more sort of uh, Powerful and sort of subtle forces at work there. It was probably the thirds. The the thirds. What? <laughs> Those monk characters. No, I think it was just. Uh, it's sort of like almost like typical Hollywood. Yeah, it, but Hollywood Hollywood almost filters out the same shit over and over again. Yeah. They don't really expose what some of the messages that come out in these books for good reason. I think. I mean, they don't want to influence. Uh, the, the, the market at large, uh, with certain ideas. And it, it's a consistent filter. And it's so, it's so consistent that, that there's got to be a damn instruction book on this thing. And it's got to be a policy with some institution that's enforcing this thing. And, or at least, you know, uh, seating themselves among the, the casting agents and the writers. I mean, uh, I got to start talking to a couple of my friends who are writing in Hollywood right now. I just start investigating some of this stuff because it's it's so blatant it, it it's the same formula every time uh same kind of filtering system stonemasons run the country i don't know it's weird that's a simpsons reference <laughs> we should have some of your friends uh who are writing hollywood on our podcast that would be good for their <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> good for their <laughs> careers or good for <laughs> good for the podcast well one of my yeah one of my friends already good or terrible one of my friends already two? operates under a pseudonym i mean uh, it's nothing for him to come up with another yeah, one. Yeah, I'm right? sure he would come up with a pseudonym to be on this podcast. <laughs> he would. I would recommend it. Now, and also another difference in this movie from the book is that uh, John Carter wants to get back to Earth. Like, that's kind of the plot that is dri- is driving him. Although That's where all the good pussy is, Ryan. That's where all the good pussy is. <laughs> Mars pussy, they're laying eggs and shit. None of that <laughs> bullshit on Earth. And, and that's another right. change from the book. In the book, that he doesn't care about getting back. He's in love. He's in love in the book. Look, I'm getting hammered here. I need to go to bed. <laughs> I have I have drank a lot of bourbon. All right, well, podcast. All right, let's go around the horn. And just everyone say their closing thoughts. Wilk, your final thoughts on the book and movie. Go ahead. Ah, uh, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed the book. I uh, appreciated the subtle racism, and uh, I thought it was very compelling. Thought it had a lot of insight and uh, set a lot of uh, bold precedents in science fiction. And I'd recommend anyone that loves sci-fi to at least read the, this book. You'll probably get a kick out of it. It's a quick read. The movie, it's not terrible, but it, it's it, it could be better. Okay, Rick. Um, I you know I, I I thought that the movie could have been good. I I wasn't wide awake and I didn't see enough of it. There was a lot of detail in the movie. I, I might want to rewatch that movie, <clears throat> barring all of the uh, the the filters that it put on uh, from the original story. But the 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 original story was hard to uh, kind of uh, grasp a hold of just because it was so damn annoying with his self aggrandizations about you know his abilities and everything that he can do on on the uh the lesser gravity and he just sort of attributed everything to his own cunning which was annoying as hell but uh it the book grew on me as uh, the story progressed and i actually had some liking for the main character when it was all finished he was very self-sacrificing and he fought for love and he actually joined the different races of mars which was which was nice. I guess that's true. I'll say uh, he. I guess John Carter does do some things. I said he's kind of a jerk. I, I still think he's kind of a jerk. Um, he does. 
he, he's a jerk, but he does some good things. I say the book is it is free. First of all, it's in the public domain. We should mention that you can literally get this book for free for uh, in an ebook format. So it's definitely worth checking out. And I think if you just submit yourself to the fact that it's older literature written kind of in a different style in a different era, it's it's worth checking out to see where a lot of the stuff we love today it has come from. And, and and oh, fun fact! It's actually written by the owner of the L.A. Clippers. Too topical. And <laughs> I'll say the movie I. <laughs> I see faults with it. I didn't hate it. I actually have seen it twice now. Um, I did fall asleep during it. Um, I can see where it got mixed reviews. I, it, there's a lot of, it's fun. I mean, they, they put a lot of effort into it, and I enjoy it for that fact. I, I kind of wish. Right. Yeah. It's not bad. I, I kind of wish they were going to make more, but I do see why it's not a great movie. It does have problems in, I, I, that's basically it. So that wraps it up. Uh, so, you know, go ahead and, uh, if you're listening to our podcast, we appreciate it if you would put reviews or, uh, ratings on iTunes, check out our website at nodeodorant.com and tell everyone you know to listen to it or not. Don't drink and drive. Or, or tell people to avoid it. You should listen to it. But anyways, join us at our it's next good. episode where we'll be discussing Starship Troopers by Robert A. Heinlein and the movie Starship Troopers, which is directed by Peter Verhoeven and starred Casper Van Dien. So, hey, P.S. It's a good movie. All right, good. All right, thank you and good night and goodbye, everyone. Good night. See ya. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. For more information on this episode's subject matter and to read our show notes and post your witty comments, visit us at nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit RyanShawnOReilly.com For more information on David Wilkinson or Richard Bell, view their profiles at Goodreads.com The theme music for this podcast was written and composed by John Doyle from the band I Decline. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We hope you've learned a lot. Oh, and always remember one thing. There is no deodorant in outer space. <laughs>